Bing. Okay, there we go. Welcome to the next episode. I forget what I want. I think this is episode nine of the exercise application assignment. I'm your host, Graylin Moon. Today is September 9th. I mean, what am I saying? September 15th, 2023. Um, I read the date and it said 9-15. I was about to say, I was about to say, like, something stupid. September 9th, the 15th. <laughs> but, okay. I don't have a ton of time today. But, let's get it. Okay, so today was a TA-led session. We basically walked through everything, broke us up into groups, and we walked through some stuff. So, um... I'll try and relate all of that to my training today. Training today was legs with the hamstring and glute focus. So I started out hitting calves because I ain't got no calves. <laughs> They're getting better. But so we did leg press calf raises. I like the standing calf raise machine, but I feel like I get a lot better uh, stretch on the um, leg press when I do calf raises. So. I decided to go for those I've been doing. I did them for the past two leg days, so I'm liking them right now. Let's see. After I did that, I did seated hamstring curls, and I do the mechanical drop set. So I start lean forward, and then I lean back, and then after that, I did stiff legged RDLs, which I said that correctly, not stiff legged deadlifts, not RDLs. It's a stiff legged RDL. There's a difference. I don't really care. It's mainly a semantic game um, with that sort of thing. Then after that, I did, um, where did I go from there? RDL, let's take a look at RDL. Oh yeah, then I did um, Smith Machine Bulgarian Split Squats for a little bit of quad action, uh, but m mostly glutes there. Um, I did two sets of those instead. What I had been doing is the little hip mat, the, I mean the glute master machine. And I like that well enough. Um, <clears throat> I was just seeing if this, uh, if it was worth doing two sets on this. And I think it is, to be honest. I don't, I get a little bit out of that glute master machine, but I don't know. I just don't like it very much. It's not very, uh, I don't connect well with my glutes on my, uh, when I use that machine, so I just, like I feel like I'll squeeze or whatever, but I just don't, I don't feel like I can get much out of it. Um, and then after that, I did the adductor machine for the inside of my thigh, two sets there, and then that was it. And so let's r run that through training. So what I'm going to attempt to do is in the about seven minutes that we have left in this video is walk through bioenergetics all the way up to muscle contraction. So bear with me. Right, because I'm going to try and do this without drawing, just in case with the oral exam, I can't draw. Um, but I heard there was a whiteboard in there, which could help me. But basically, let's go right here th through the thing. We'll start up with the PCR system. So phosphocreatine plus ADP gets us ATP and uh, creatine. And that is good. That's, what is it, governed by creatine kinase. Now glycolysis, glycolysis starts out, we started with the glucose molecule. Glucose is phosphorylated by, um, oh my gosh, this is the most basic thing ever. G6P? No, 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 no. Glucose, it's a kinase. It's been a minute since I've reviewed this, this is good. This is a good thing that I'm doing right here. Um, oh man, I'm going to have to consult the notes. I am ashamed. I can't believe I forgot the very first enzyme. I'm going to see this and like lose my marbles. ATP hexo, no, wait, what? What is it? Yeah, hexokinase, yeah. Hexokinase. That's your first energy investment. ATP goes in, hexokinase, and then we get G6P. G6P is then isomerized by um, phosphofructoisomerase. Is that right? I'm not looking at the other stuff, by the way. I'm, uh, is that isomerized by phosphoglucose isomerase? Yes, to, to S6P, phospho, 
what is it, fructose six phosphate, and then what is it? It's converted into F one six biphosphate through uh, PFK one, uh, which is phosphofructokinase. Yes, and then you have so you have that you have F one six P, then that gets split by aldolase into DHAP and G three P. G three P is isomerized through. Um, What is the isomerized by? Yeah, 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 yeah. Trios phosphate isomerase. Trios, okay. Dang, I'm forgetting all the enzymes. Usually that's how I remember the thing, but when they're reviewing class, they just go through other stuff. Anyways, uh, I'm being too slow with this. So it gets into that, and you have so a few more phosphate groups shifted around, and then you wind up producing four more ATP through that. You had two energy investments. The other energy investment I forgot to mention was that PFK. Um, oh, voice crack. Because I'm bent over talking. But that's uh, that's that pretty much. You have two pyruvate at the vent at the end. The two pyruvate, well, you'll take one of the pyruvate and it'll go to the, um, it can go to lactate and then go through the Cori cycle. Or it can go to the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle it's going to, um, NADH can act as a cofactor shoot off a of CO2, you have acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is gonna bind with oxaloacetate in order to get citrate. Citrate will then undergo a series of, you know, bullcrap essentially to net us three NADH and one FADH. Those will go to the electron transport chain where NADH will um, go start at the first pump and go through, start and then FADH will start at the second pump and go through. And you're going to get 10 hydrogen for uh, every NADH, and you're going to get six hydrogen, yeah, six hydrogen for every FADH. And for every four uh, hydrogen that you produce, you get one ATP. The third pump is going to um, pump out the, um, the hydrogen electrons or whatever, and that's going to bind with oxygen, and that's how we get metabolic water you have O2 minus plus O2 minus and then the hydrogen comes out and bam water um, metabolic water is what it's called so then how's that related to nerve impulses so with nerve impulses let's see you start with an action potential right so in order, how do you get an action potential basically sodium is kind of like trickling in some of those gates are open um, it trickles in, and after it gets to a certain threshold level, it go the um, sodium gates all open up, and then the uh, sodium from the outside, where there's a bunch of it, comes into the cell, depolarizes the cell um, really quickly. It like slowly depolarizes or whatever, like as it's open, and then once it hits threshold, then whoosh, you know we have a rush in. Depolarization uh, signal is propagated down the cell. And then as that happens, voltage-gated um, potassium channels open up. Potassium's shot out, essentially, um, in order to restore us back to um, baseline. So we're super positive, and then we shoot the potassium out, and then we're kind of working our way down back to baseline. And in fact, we become, that's called repolarization. Um, and as we're we polarize, we become hyperpolar. We are in this refractory period, right? Where we're below baseline. We're hyperpolarized in refractory period. In order to restore that, we need um, the sodium potassium pump to pump out three sodium and bring in two potassium, um, which is what it does. And it uses ATP to do that. That's where we get bioenergetics involved there. And then that's how we restore ourselves back to resting membrane potential. And so that action potential that we just sent, you know, where sodium's depolarizing uh, the cell, going in kind of a wave down to the synaptic input, these vesicles get shot out. They're full of a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter will bind to ligand-gated um, protein channels on the on the um, what is it? The muscle fiber, and the muscle fiber will will similar things sort of happens. You bind to those channels opens up and then the neuro, 
the neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter binds to those ligand gated channels that opens up, sodium rushes in, sends a depolarization signal down uh, the muscle, and the sarcolemma, right? And the sarcolemma is continuous with T tubules, and T tubules run um, transversely through the uh, muscle cell. I mean, yeah, yeah, the muscle cell. And when they go off, they're propagating down the cell. At a certain point, they're going to um, activate these dihydropyridine receptors. And then those in turn will activate these ryanidine receptors on um, the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium gets released into the sarcomere, or the sarcoplasm, I mean. It's the same diff, really. <laughs> um, and the calcium binds to troponin. Troponin, troponin is kind of like the active site on uh, the thin filament. So calcium binds to troponin, and that allows actin to change. I mean, that allows tropomyosin to change the shape of actin, so that the myosin head can bind to actin. So what happens is the myosin head has ADP and inorganic phosphate on it, and when you know the active site's ready, it binds, and then inorganic phosphate is kind of shot off, and you kind of have like a little halfway pull. It's like cocked and ready, and then um, ADP gets released and that's when you have your power stroke, you know, it's pulling this way. So you have your power stroke there. Then ATP comes along, along and is hydrolyzed by ATP ACE, which allows the myosin head to break its bond. And ADP and inorganic phosphate are binded back to the myosin head. And that's, a, that's the basics of muscle contraction. Some other things to consider, I'll just go over really quickly, trying to make this video too long, um, is, you know, God, there's actually so much content to cover. How does that relate? Obviously, muscle contraction while I'm working out. Fatigue, muscle fatigue, muscles fatigue because uh, they don't have uh, any more carbohydrates. You don't have any more, you know, glycogen in your system, really. And you need that in order to keep uh, fats burning because fats burn in the presence of carbohydrates. That means you need NADH in order to beta-oxidize uh, fatty acid chains. And NADH is produced like I mentioned earlier, through the Krebs cycle, and the Krebs cycle runs through carbohydrates first. You know, I mean, you, you produce the pyruvate, which is produced from glucose, you know. So you kind of need that present. I mean, you'll have, if you're burned through your carbohydrates first, you'll have a bunch of NADH in your system. The only thing is, is like at a certain point, I'd imagine you run out. Um, size principle, you know, there are different uh, functional aspects of muscle. Um, what is it? Bigger motor units are going to be recruited later than smaller motor units. You know, that's the size principle. Um, is there anything else I'm kind of forgetting here? That's like basic, basic. Basic, basic kind of run through. Uh, fatigue also is a result of hydrogen binding to the active site on where on troponin. Um, it kind of steals calcium's place and then free, free radicals and inorganic phosphate can screw up the electron transport pumps. Uh, yeah, the types of muscle fibers, slow twitch, more mitochondria, greater blood supply, um, more myoglobin. Uh, it's also got less uh, contractile proteins in it. It's not as powerful. Type 2 muscle fibers, just the opposite. Type 2 muscle fibers can contract faster because they have a higher ATPase activity, so they can cycle through cross-bridge cycling much faster. Um, it's also muscle force regulation, you know, if they're more forceful movements cannot be as fast. The types of MUs recruited, you know, if you recruit more MUs, that's motor units, you get more force. Mm-hmm. There's an optimal length of muscle contraction due to how myosin and actin overlap. Um, basically, you want to maximize the overlap and minimize what is it? you want. You want to have as much overlap as possible while still having a significant enough range of motion to shorten. Because if um, I, they're fully overlapped, there's not really much room to shorten, so you can't have the time to generate the force. Um, but I'm basically going to cut it off right there. I've rambled on for about 15 minutes now. Have a great day.